Welcome to our second segment of our interview with Dr. Fine. Can you talk to us about your research in site recovery? Love to. So I got into this by accident. Um, I was actually working with deaf subjects, mm -hmm. looking at how auditory cortex responds to visual stimuli in the deaf. And my husband was watching TV. Yeah. I noticed this story of this guy who had been blind from the age of three to 43 and then got his sight back. Wow. And he sort of said, oh, you should be interested in this. And I was sort of, uh-huh. And mm -hmm. then um, another colleague rang me up and said, oh, you should be interested in this. And I was kind of like, uh-huh, too weird. And finally, my supervisor was, call this man. <laughs> And I, I never occurred to me that it could be a real case of sight recovery because mm -hmm. they're incredibly rare. Yeah. I rang up and it was, and it's probably been the most interesting couple of years of my research career. The reason I never expected it to be real um, was these cases are incredibly rare. You only mm -hmm. get them when there's some sort of revolution in ophthalmological procedure. Yeah. You learn how to take cataracts out, or in this case, you learn how to do a limbal st epithelial stem cell replacement, and someone who previously was inoperable mm -hmm. suddenly becomes operable again. And so they've had this amazing experience of spending 40 years in the dark, and then suddenly, bam, all this visual information comes in. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit about the patient that you worked with and what that was like for you? One of the fascinating things about studying this is that in science we go in these little steps, you know, one after another. Um, I do this, somebody else does this, I take the next step. Mm -hmm. When I started studying Mike, um, I thought, well, I'll read the literature. But the last literature that we had on site recovery subjects was almost 20 years ago, more oh. than 20 years ago. We knew nothing about the brain compared to what we know now. So you read this literature and you realize that there's just this whole world out there you don't know about. It's mm -hmm. like being in this little boat in the middle of this ocean of you know, ignorance, yeah. not even knowing where to start. And it was very intimidating. I was you know, quite a junior scientist. I wasn't that much older than you. I was 30, I guess, maybe mm -hmm. quite a lot older than you. But um, <laughs> I was about 30, maybe younger. And it was scary to suddenly be somewhere where no, there wasn't an obvious next step. But it, it was very good for me. It taught me to be much braver in my science. So what did you do to get that next step? I was very conservative. I basically ran everything. I relied on the fact I'm a good, fast programmer, and so I just threw stimuli at him. I just I threw everything but the kitchen sink in there. In fact, I think I showed him pictures of kitchen sinks. Uh -huh. um, everything. And then what would happen is I'd run these tests, and then I'd look at the data, and I'd think, oh, that's weird. And I'd program all night, and then I'd throw him some more. And a lot of this, you know, experiments were kind of broken, or there was something wrong. But eventually, I started to kind of have a map. Mm -hmm. um, the most interesting moment was I'd shown him these pictures of, you know, wire drawing of cubes, those things you draw in high school, you know, little wire drawings. Yeah. And I'd said, what does this look like? And he'd said, oh, it looks like a square with lines. Hmm. And I thought, that's interesting. No yeah. sense of depth. And then later, I had a picture of a cube moving in depth. Mm -hmm. And it was obviously for him, like he'd put on 3D spectacles. Mm -hmm. And it popped out in depth. He's like, oh, it's a cube. It's going in and out. And he thought it was just the funniest thing he'd ever seen. And that was that just because it was moving? Because it was moving. Wow. And there was this weird dissociation between his ability to see stationary cues, the cues you see in an art gallery, mm -hmm. and movement cues. And, you know, it was this amazing moment. It was in science where you suddenly think, like, I know something that nobody else knows. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Yeah. Often in science you know something nobody else knows, but it's usually really boring. This was interesting, too. Yeah, definitely. It was a cool moment. What was that like for your patient, Mike? To have your sight back after 40 years. So yeah. he had had some vision from like birth to three, mm -hmm. but he had no memory of it. He had no visual memories. So his visual system would have been pretty normal. At three, we have almost adult vision. Mm -hmm. But then, bam, the lights go out for 40 years. Um, there's a lovely description of what vision must be like for an infant, mm -hmm. which is a bright buzzing confusion. Yeah. It's Gibson. <laughs> and that was very much what it was like for Mike. It was overwhelming at first. Um, if he wanted to concentrate, he had to close his eyes. He had trouble doing things that he could do before because the visual information made it more difficult. So crossing a road, he would be frightened by all the cars. Mm -hmm. There's another case study of someone who had the same experience. But gradually, he learned to kind of zone in on what was useful in his vision and ignore what wasn't useful. Yeah. Um, but he's, he's very much a blind person with vision, 
not a visual person. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, it's a, it's a, he, he's, the vision is something that helps him. Uh, the best metaphor he, he, is, he, he described, he says, I look at a keyboard mm -hmm. and I don't know what it is and then I touch it and then the visual information makes sense. Uh -huh. um, and that's, we work the other way. If I give you a plastic animal, you'll feel it and you'll think, oh, maybe it feels like a giraffe. But mm -hmm. it's only when you look at it that the touch will make sense. Right. He, he's the other way around, which hmm. is really interesting. That is. It seems like it would be really difficult to adjust to that after getting so used to not being able to see for 40 years. There's actually, um, it is. Um, there's cases of actually a suicide in the literature of someone who just couldn't deal with the visual information. I think it's a wow. little easier now because people are warned it's going to be difficult. They're yeah. not told, oh, you can see. Mm -hmm. One good metaphor is imagine if someone suddenly gave you radar. Mm -hmm. And there's these beeps and chirps and clicks in your head that, you know, make no sense. And everyone's like, well, use your radar. Why are you turning on the lights? You've got radar now. Use yeah. it. Radar is great. And you're just like, I can't make sense of this. Um, another metaphor is a graduate student of mine. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this. And she said, well, I got depressed moving from New York to San Diego. I found that change difficult. Yeah. Imagine if every single thing you do, pouring a cup of coffee, walking down the street has to be done in a different way. Mm -hmm. Change is very hard to deal with. And it is. having to change every, the way you do everything has got to be overwhelming for mm -hmm. most people. Luckily, Mike's a change seeker, so he yeah. has dealt with it very well. So would you say that his brain sort of resorted back to when he was very young and still had to like uh, sort of relearn everything as an infant would? Ah. Uh. That was the real question. Would it kind of, there were three things that could happen. One of which is that he could have vision of a three-year-old, which mm -hmm. is very good. Yeah. So he would be essentially pretty normal. Mm -hmm. um, the other would be that his brain had kind of reverted back to, you know, the vision of someone who was a year old, for example. Um, and the other is what actually happened was something slightly weirder, which is that some things were fine. Mm -hmm. Motion processing seems to be fine. Right. But other things like face processing, object processing, aren't normal and haven't improved. Hmm. And the things that are easy and difficult don't map on entirely to kind of what you would expect from what we believe about the developmental time yeah. course. Do you so know why that would be? I think that different areas of the brain differ in how plastic they are in adulthood. Mm -hmm. So, if you think about it, we have to recognize new faces throughout our life. Yeah. I'm going to meet you now. I'll recognize you the next when I see you tomorrow. Something in my brain has changed. Mm -hmm. When I meet you a year from now, you'll have changed. You'll mm -hmm. have a pair of glasses by then, because <laughs> hopefully you'll replace the ones you just broke. <laughs> but I'll still be able to recognize you. And then I'll remember what you look like with glasses. So yes. the areas that are responsible for faces, I'll meet you 40 years from now, and you'll be gray, and I'll be dead. Um, <laughs> So that won't happen. Um, the bits of our brain that are responsible for processing faces have to be very plastic through mm -hmm. life. The bits of our brain that process motion, they have to learn these rules of how m objects move in the world. But these mm -hmm. rules are really rules of physics. They don't change. And so once you've learned them as a child, then your visual motion processing system doesn't have to really learn anything new. Yeah. And so I think that the areas of the brain that are dependent on experience are the ones that are affected by deprivation. And what does Mike tell us about neuroplasticity? Mike's this sort of unique case that actually can provide some really cute ways of studying neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. um, so one of my favorite studies is actually one that was thought of by a very um, talented young researcher at Caltech, Melissa Sciens. And she wanted to tackle the question of when people are blind and visual cortex reorganizes, mm -hmm. Is there a sort of system to this, or is it just random? Yeah. And so in visual cortex, there's this area called MT+, plus mm -hmm. that responds to visual motion in normally sighted people. So it responds when you see something that's moving. If you don't see anything moving, it doesn't respond. Very right. simple. And her question was, in someone who is blind, mm -hmm. would that area respond to auditory motion, for example? Mm -hmm. The problem with studying it is that it's, this, the location of this area varies across individuals. Okay. And how do you find it in a blind subject? Yeah. You can't present a visual motion stimuli and 
find out where MT is and then see if it lights up to auditory motion. Mm -hmm. So what she did is she used Mike as a sort of hybrid. He's sighted and he's blind. Yeah. So she used visual motion stimuli to find this area, and mm -hmm. then she looked in this area and found that that area responded to auditory motion more than to other kinds of auditory stimuli. Mm. So she kind of used this trick that you can think of Mike as a sort of sighted person and a blind person at the same time. We actually ran the same study on blind people, and we do mm -hmm. see nice auditory motion responses in a similar area. Yeah. But in those subjects, it's much harder to say, oh, yeah, but that's definitely this area MT, mm -hmm. especially because there are actually areas that respond to auditory motion quite close to that area. So that was a very cute study. It was um, her idea. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was very nice because it provided a demonstration that when you have cross-modal plasticity in blind subjects, mm -hmm. it's not random. It actually has an organization. And that makes sense, that you would kind of make use of the natural organization of cortex. So that's um, an example of the way that might can be useful in helping us understand cross-modal plasticity. Yeah. What did you learn from your work with Mike? Um, the thing I learned, be brave about research questions. Don't, don't, don't do incremental research. Don't do research where somebody else is likely to publish the same thing as you mm -hmm. a year earlier than you get on with it. It is really nice working in an area where you can take time and relax and think about questions because nobody else is working in the same area. Right. And in Mike's case, it's very simple. There are not many site recovery patients out mm -hmm. there. But there are other, you know, don't look under the, don't look for your keys where the light is. Look for your keys in the dark. You know, go, go where nobody else is. It's more interesting that way. <laughs> um, in terms of what I learned about cross-modal plasticity in neural organization, I think it is that, and this is the sort of thing that scientists hate, is I saw Mike, and he's this very functional blind person. He uses mm -hmm. a cane beautifully. He reads Braille incredibly fast. He, 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 lived li he lives life as a blind person, even before and after his vision mm -hmm. was restored. He lives this full, complicated life. I don't have to take him to the gate at the airport. I drop him off yeah. you know, at the entrance of the airport like I would anybody else. Um, and then when I started working in retinal prostheses, I mm -hmm. saw people who were late blind, and I would test them in the same testing room for a year, and then I'd still have to escort them to the bathroom. Mm. They still couldn't find their way to the bathroom. With Mike, you would show them the first time, and that would be it. Yeah. You would know from that point on. And it made me realize that there is a vast difference between early blind and late blind people. And the problem we have is that it's so much harder to adjust to vision loss if you're old and that is the majority of people who are blind. Most, the main cause of blindness in the Western world is retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration and glaucoma. And these are diseases that hit people in their 40s, their 50s, their 70s, their 80s. Um, the, the main cause of blindness in young people is either cortical damage, which is a tragedy and going to be very difficult to deal with, mm -hmm. or cataracts in the third world, which is a $10 operation. That yeah. one's easy to fix. <laughs> Um, and so learning how to teach people who are older to mm -hmm. use a cane, to use Braille, yeah. it's the huge challenge for rehab. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and if you could solve that, you would, that, that would be a real important question for neuroplasticity, how to teach yeah. these people to learn to use a cane or Braille. There are various sorts of things, one's called voice, called sensory substitution. Mm -hmm. The idea is you put a device on the tongue that gives you information or a device on the back that has a little pushy things that tell you where things are or an auditory thing that kind of will describe the visual world in terms of audition. Just to take in the sensory information? Yes, yeah, so it's taking visual information, it's converting into auditory information or tactile mm -hmm. information. And one of the big problems with all of these is that people who are blind early in life, the cane, is a sub sensory substitution device, and it's brilliant. It's yeah. really very good. A dog is a sensory substitution device. Braille mm -hmm. is a sensory substitution device. People have never invented devices that work better than these three things. Yeah. You know, the Braille was the most brilliant invention ever. Cane is actually a brilliant invention. And in people who are late blind, I don't think they're going to learn to use these technologies any better than they learn to read Braille or use a cane. People yeah. are elderly actually have great trouble learning to use a cane properly or mm -hmm. using Braille properly. Um, this ability to learn new information 
you know, and we'd all like it. I have trouble. I have more trouble learning things now than I did when I was your age. Yeah. I know more, but I forget more. I think my brain is full. It goes in one end, not the other. <laughs> what are some treatment programs that are being used to help people with deprivation or that have suffered from brain damage? Um, there's a big dissociation between basic researchers who are just uh -huh. trying to understand the neural mechanisms across, you know, plasticity and rehab people. Yeah. Rehab people deal with messiness. They deal with people who are of all different ages, all different IQ levels, all different kinds of stroke damage, all different levels of vision. Mm -hmm. And they really work with a sort of intuition. They, they're desperately trying to get information from basic science to guide rehab practice. But yeah. at the moment, there still isn't a link between those two disciplines that there should be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very hard, to, for example, cortical visual damage due to stroke in adulthood or damage in childhood mm -hmm. is a huge issue for rehab specialists, but it's very difficult for researchers to study because it's very messy. Yeah. Um, you've got to deal with, you know, mapping out the cortical lesion. It's going to be different for every patient. These patients are going to have other cognitive problems that make it very hard to run vision tests on them. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard that what would be a really important clinical question is a very tough question for a scientist. I've stayed away from it. It's too hard. Yeah. Even though, I, you know, I have a nephew with this. I would love to provide something useful in that area, but mm -hmm. it's too hard. Well, thank you for sharing your information about Mike. We really appreciate that. And I've found the information very fascinating. Oh, I, I enjoy doing this work too. <laughs>